What a night already. Now, I'm sure that you're looking at the clock thinking, some of you are. You might be. So here's the deal. I am so glad that we went a little bit longer on that. So I'm going to actually cut my message back. It's my commitment to you. But here's the deal. I'm going to have to cut all of those amazing illustrations I came up with to rival John's. I know, like... I've been nervous all day, like, but uh, no. So it, it, this will be a little bit shorter. We're still going to get out of here by 8.30. Want to have some time on the back end to still worship because we're going to talk about rejoicing tonight. So we're going to talk about rejoicing, and here's what I want you to rejoice over. In fact, you're going to see this big idea on your screen. It's, a, it's an exclamation to you, and maybe even more than to you, it's an exclamation to me to rejoice. And here's what I want you to rejoice over. Rejoice Summit family, rejoice family, for our God specializes and delights in reviving his people. Do you believe that tonight? That your God specializes and delights in reviving his people. You know, Psalm 85 verse 6 is really kind of the core verse that we have uh, that we've been using for revive us over all these years. Psalm 85 verse 6 says, Will you not revive us, Lord, or will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That idea of reviving, I talked on the first night that we were together on Sunday, I I got up and I shared at the very beginning that Ray Ortland, a a favorite teacher of mine, uh, talks about this passage and he, he actually gives five questions. I only gave three on Sunday night. I'm going to give four questions tonight. But when you read a verse like Psalm 85, verse 6, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you, it's important to know what it's talking about. So first, get this. What is reviving or what is revival? Well, it's the Lord awakening the heart or re-energizing the hearts of his people. Well, who needs it? Well, his people, that your people may rejoice in you. What's the outcome? That we would rejoice in him. But get this, who does it? Who brings about the reviving? Is it you? Is it me? No, who is it? It's God, right? And so I'm so thankful that you and I have a God in heaven, a God who loves us, a God who loved us enough to come to live for us, to die for us, to be resurrected, to invite us into his family, a God who specializes and delights in reviving you and me. Do you remember those words of Jesus in John chapter 10 when Jesus is talking about the difference between him and the enemy, right? He says, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly, uh, Irenaeus, uh, an old church father, said this, the glory of God is man fully alive, meaning that one of the ways that God glorifies himself most is by bringing you and I, men, women, children, students, fully alive in him. And I don't know about you, but I want to take hold of that abundant life that God has for me, and I bet you want to take a hold of that abundant life as well, right? So tonight's exhortation to you and to me, to my soul, is Jamin rejoice because your God specializes and he delights in reviving his people. I wonder if you're here tonight and you know immediately when I say that, that you need reviving. That you are desperate tonight for an awakening. That you find yourself in a dry place. You find yourself in a seemingly dead place. You find yourself in a place of despair or discouragement this evening. And as I say that he specializes and delights in reviving, you know immediately, well, that's me. I need that. And I've cried out for that, but I haven't experienced it. Well, I want to encourage you tonight that I believe that God wants to revive you tonight. There's others of you here that when I said that, you immediately thought of someone in your life, someone that's close to you. Maybe it's a family member or a friend or someone that you work with. That when I say that God specializes and delights in reviving his people, you think immediately, this person needs to be revived. God has done a work in their life at some point. It seems to be non-existent right now, or they seem to be discouraged right now, or they seem to be waning in their faith right now. God, would you please revive? And here's what I want you to know, if that's you. I believe that God may very well revive those people as well. That God may very well hear your prayers tonight 
and do a mighty work of awakening in the hearts of your loved ones, your friends, your coworkers. So let's quickly just go to the Lord in prayer and let's just ask him to do that. And then we're gonna read through Psalm 85. I'm just gonna share a couple highlights with you, okay? So Father, we do pray right now that you would do your work of awakening. God, I thank you for all of these stories that we just heard. God, I thank you for the baptisms that we just witnessed. God, I thank you for the work that you have already done in your people. And so God, I don't need to convince people here tonight that you're a God that gives life. And I don't even think I need to convince people that you're a God who continues to give life, who continues to awaken. And so God, I come with my brothers and my sisters right now and I just beg you, I plead with you, will you not revive us again? Will you not revive us again so that we, your people, here at Summit Church in Southwest Florida in February of 2022, that we may rejoice in you? God, would you do that tonight? Would you be so gracious as to touch our lives, touch our hearts, touch our souls, our minds? God, would you do what only you can do? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So look at Psalm 85. Psalm 85 is a, it's a psalm of the sons of Korah. We don't really know for sure when this was written, but it seems like it was written when the people of God came back from captivity, right? So they were in Babylonian captivity and then they come back out of it, God brings them. And so they are looking back on their lives. The reasons they went into captivity were because they had turned away from God. And so God, to get their attention, sends them into captivity. And then in his grace, he brings them out. And so one author says this about Psalm 85. He says, Psalm 85 gives voice to our yearnings. It gives us words to say to God, especially when we have failed him and trashed our lives and sunk to a new low. I wonder if anyone here tonight sees their own life in that way. So much so that we're wondering, does God despise me by now? Shouldn't he despise me? Shouldn't God hammer me with exactly what I deserve? Well, maybe God getting even with us might seem right to us, but God rejoices to give us sinners our lives back and even better than before. Isn't that good news tonight? And so if you find yourself yearning in that way, hear these words of the psalmist in Psalm chapter 85. It says, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. So, Lord, you allowed us to come back. Lord, here we are back in this place. Lord, you forgave the iniquity of your people, meaning you pardoned our sins. You lifted off the burden of our sin, and you covered all of their sin. That idea of covering our sin, John talked about it a little bit the other night. It's the picture of of, uh, putting something in between an object and the person who's viewing it, so much so that the one who's viewing can't see that object anymore. And the psalmist here says, God, that's what you've done with our sin. You withdrew all of your wrath. You stopped your wrath. You pulled back your wrath and you turned from your hot anger. So first there in those first couple of verses, what we see are people who understand what God has done for them. In fact, as we walk through this passage, I want you to just see a couple things. So, so as we rejoice, well, what kind of people does God revive? First, He revives the kind of people who remember what God has done for them in forgiving their sins. Now, we've done this all throughout this week. I'm not sharing anything new with you. John did an amazing job. Psalm chapter 32, if you didn't get to hear that message, go back to the message from Monday night on our Summit website and listen to that message where he talked about the joy of confession. Right, Psalm chapter 51, David said this, "'For I know my transgressions.'" And my sin is ever before me. And against you and you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David is in a moment in his life when he's writing those words. You remember after the sin with Bathsheba where he knows what he's done and he knows how it has violated the God who continued to forgive him, the God who loved him, the God who had chosen him. And David experienced forgiveness for that sin as he goes before the Lord and he says, please blot out my transgression. Would you cleanse me and wash me? 
That's why in Psalm 32, that passage that John read the other night, the, David could say again, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know, one of the things from the other night that we were praying for as we went into that evening, and you might have even seen, we were, we were uh, excited for the opportunity to call people to confession, to have an opportunity to be honest about their lives, to be honest about those things that they had maybe hidden, those things that they were engaged in, an opportunity to confess. Because in confession, there is incredible freedom, right? In experiencing forgiveness for our sins, there is a joy that comes as we understand more and more of what God has done for us. Some folks that night confessed, and I know myself and others, some had phone calls from individuals in the church who said, I've got to talk to you about something. But I can't help but feel, and I do think it's important to say this, I can't help but feel that there are some maybe who knew that night I've got to get this off my chest. I've got to talk to someone about this. I need to confess my sin. But you just couldn't do it. Maybe you didn't have the courage in the moment. Maybe you're afraid about the repercussions. Whatever the reason was, I want to take an opportunity right now to just encourage you again, to call you again to a place of confession, to call you again to a place where, where you can lay it all out before the Lord and with others, and you can experience the freedom that comes with forgiveness. You see, because God longs to revive his people, and the type of people that he revives are people who understand what he's done for them in forgiving their sins. And if we hold on to those things, if we can't engage with those things, if we are unwilling to be honest with those things, then what hope do we have of God's reviving work in our lives, right? So as John said, even sometimes God's thumb is pressed down in those moments where it actually shows us, okay, why am I not engaging with God? Why does it seem as though things are so hard? Why in the world am I not experiencing joy or abundance in life? Well, sometimes it's because we have sin that we haven't dealt with. And I wanna call you to that again tonight. I wanna encourage you to confess your sins Confess your sins one to another. Confess your sins to God, and he is faithful and just to forgive you. Amen? I wonder if any of us have testimonies about the way that God has been faithful and just in forgiving us of our sins. I know that I do. Well, what kind of people does God revive? He revives those of us who are honest and who remember what he's done in dealing with our sins. Second thing I want you to see is this. It starts in verse four. So the psalmist here, he's been saying, God, this is what you did. You forgave us. And then verse four, so restore to us again. Restore us again. That word restore, it means turn us back. God, would you turn us back just like you turned away from your hot anger? Would you turn us toward yourself? Restore us again. That word again is important because sometimes I think that God tires of us. But here we see the psalmist saying again, which tells us that it's something that God does over and over again. God, would you turn us back, O God of our salvation? And would you put away your indignation toward us? Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? There it is again. Will you not awaken us again? Will you not re-energize us again? That your people may rejoice in you, that we might be glad in you? Lord, show us your steadfast love and grant us your salvation. What kind of people does God revive? Well, he revives those who remember what he's done, but he also revives those who are ready to be turned back to him. Those who in their hearts know that you are turned in the wrong direction, that you have turned toward your circumstances, you have turned toward your uh, functional idols, your gods, you've turned toward your sin, you've turned toward something other than God. Well, who does God revive but people who desire to be turned back to him. Sons and daughters who, like the prodigal son, run back to their father. Habakkuk talks about this. He says, oh Lord, I've heard the report of you. And Habakkuk's talking about the people of the land. He says, I've heard of your work, O Lord. In the midst of the years, 
Your work, Lord, would you revive it? In the midst of, your, of the years, would you make it known? And in wrath, would you remember your mercy? Well, what had the people done? A contemporary of Habakkuk, Jeremiah, tells us what the people had done. He says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken uh, me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Here's what God was saying about his people. My people have chosen to turn away from me, and in turning away from me, they have tried to build for themselves these cisterns that will hold water. And he's talking spiritually speaking there. They've tried to build for themselves these systems that will satisfy them and sustain them. And God says, I cannot bless that. And so, of course, they experience the pain of that turning away from him. But what we know about God is that he's a God who delights in restoring again. He's a God who delights in reviving Again, and so maybe you find yourself in a spot tonight where you have forsaken the Lord, you've turned away from the Lord, you've tried to build a system around your life where you can sustain yourself and you can satisfy yourself, and what you're finding over and over and over again is those things that you've built for yourselves, they don't hold water. They can never be for you what you wanted them to be. And so you find yourself in a place tonight where you know if I don't turn away from this and turn back to God, I don't know what hope I have. And so you find yourself saying, God, would you wake me up again? God, would you do a work in my life that only you could do, and would you do it again? Seth Haynes, uh, a guy, he's writing actually in his book on um, his alcoholism, his addiction to alcohol, and what it took to actually get him away from that. And he's talking about waking up, and he says it's about waking. And when I say waking, he says, I mean both waking from and waking to. Waking from the numb floating, the drifting higher and higher. Waking uh, from your attempts to self-soothe, to anesthetize your pain. Waking from the false, the fake, the pleasant dream that's now turned to fear that always precedes the crash. Waking from dependency and addiction and recurring habits that might do you in. Waking from your addictions. This is only a part of what it means to wake up. Or waking from your idols or waking up from your desires. Waking up is only part of what it means. He goes on and he says, it's only part. What do you wake to? So you wake from those things, but you wake to, away from those things. Waking from addiction, sorry, he says, to the transcendent, to the numinous, to the cosmic quantum healer, waking from addiction and to the divine synapse, every, uh, excuse me, sorry, I'm skipping around. Waking from addiction and to the divine love of God expressed through Jesus, the Christ, get this, who wants to repair every frayed nerve, every broken synapse, and every jacked up desire. Now what he's talking about there is his addiction to alcohol but you put whatever it is in there. And I know that there are folks tonight, even folks who heard what John had to say the other night, who you just couldn't take that step forward. And so tonight is another invitation. Wait a second, I need to wake up from the things that I've been looking at. I need to wake up from my addiction to these things. I need to wake up from my despair. I need to wake up from my defiance. And I need to turn back to Jesus, trusting that he wants to repair every frayed nerve, every broken synapse, every jacked up desire. Lewis Drummond, he's writing about revival and what happens in the church, not just individuals. And he's writing about how God has done it historically over and over and over again. Right? If you were to read through your Bible, you would see it in the history of Israel. You would see how God revives his people, his people walk away from him, uh, it gets so bad, and then he revives his people, and then they walk away, and then he revives his people, and it's a pattern. And it doesn't just happen in biblical history, it's happened throughout all of history, right? With the Reformation, and the First Great Awakening, and the Second Great Awakening, and what happened in the 70s with, with the Jesus people, and all of these things have happened throughout history. And so Drummond is writing about it, and he says, the question is not, will the church be revived? Right? One may just as well ask, will the sun rise in the morning? The issue is, when will God's people be revived? And here's what I want you to know. 
right? So he's talking about the church as a whole and culture as a whole. I'm talking about you. Because it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with the people of God actually believing that God is who he says that he is, believing and remembering what he's done for us in giving us Jesus Christ uh, so that we could be forgiven of our sins, and then making the choice, God, would you turn me back to you and, and receiving what it is that he does for you? The question isn't, will God revive his people? The question is, when? And so rather than walk in the darkness so long, rather than walk in the despair or the frustration or the defiance, what would it look like to just surrender? To just surrender who you are and to ask God to come in and do in you what only God can do. The psalmist there says, would you restore to us again? Would you revive us again? And I'm saying to the Lord tonight, would you restore me again? Would you revive me again? I'm saying, Lord, my loved ones, the people in my life that I'm praying for, God, would you restore them again? Would you revive them again? I'm praying for my church, would you restore us again? Would you revive us again? And I hope that you are praying for your own self and for the people in your life. God, would you restore us again? Would you revive us again? Because God, we know that's what you do. And we know that you specialize and delight in reviving your people. And so God, for those that long to turn back to you, would you turn us back? And would you turn them back? Right? Last thing is this, and then we're done, I told you. Right? So he goes on and he says, well, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But that, let them not turn back to folly. Right? So even the person writing this psalm knows how easy it is for the people of God who are calling out to be turned back to God to immediately turn back to their own folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. And then he gives this beautiful picture, the psalmist. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other, right? So most believe that that's a picture forward to what the Lord would do in bringing Jesus, right? Jesus comes, steadfast love, he's faithfulness, those things meet in Christ, he is righteous, he does what's right, he is peace, he brings about harmony and all that comes with peace, and all of those things meet together with Jesus. So it's a picture of what Jesus would be and what he would provide for us faithfulness springing up from the ground, righteousness looking down from the sky. Someday, perfect, right? In eternity, we'll experience these things. But even the promise for those things now, the ability to experience his faithfulness in our lives and his righteousness reigning over us. And then the psalmist says this, oh yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase for righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Here's what I want you to see with this, and the band can come on up. What type of person does the Lord revive? Well, the Lord revives someone who remembers what he's done for us and forgiving us. He revives the person who knows their need to turn back and who are ready to be turned back. But then he also revives those people who receive the good that he does and the good that he gives. People who look at their life and recognize, maybe it's not exactly what I want, but because I have you, I have steadfast love and faithfulness meeting. I have righteousness and peace. I can experience faithfulness springing up from the ground, righteousness looking down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. Do you believe that today? So as you turn back to him, you're not turning back to less of a life, you're turning back to what? The abundant life. Remember, because Jesus came and he said, the thief, what does he do? He comes to steal. He comes to kill, he comes to destroy, but not me. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. There are people in this room who I love so dearly, and you're not experiencing that abundant life right now. And I just want to implore you. I want to cry out for you. I want to cry out, Lord, would you revive my friends? Lord, would you revive my family? Lord, would you revive the people in this room? Because I want you to experience the abundant life. And I know that God specializes and delights in giving that type of a life to his people. So would you take it? 
Would you reach out? Would you receive the good that the Lord has for you? Because you can rejoice, Summit family. Rejoice, Summit family. The songs we're going to sing, we're going to rejoice. Why? Because this is who our God is. This is who our God is. We can say, of course, will he not revive us again that his people may rejoice in him? Well, of course he will. Because he, he's a God who forgives. He's a God who turns his people back. He's a God who does what is good and who gives what is good. Final thing I want you to hear is this, and you can stand with me as I read this. We look and we say, well, most notably, what is it that we have in Jesus? What is this good that he's done for us? And what is this good that he's given to us? And you'll see these words on your screen. This is from an older guy, dead for hundreds of years, Octavius Winslow. And in writing about what God has done for us in Jesus and the reviving work of Jesus, listen to what he says. The cross of Jesus displays the most awful exhibition of God's hatred of sin. And at the same time, it's the most august manifestation of his readiness to pardon it. Pardon, full and free, is written out in every drop of blood that is seen. It's proclaimed in every groan that is heard. O oh, blessed door of return, open and never shut to the wanderer from God. Any wanderers in here tonight? Well, there's a door that is open and never shut to the wanderer from God. How glorious, how free, how accessible is this God? Here, the sinful, the vile, the guilty, the unworthy, the poor, the penniless may come. Here too, the weary spirit may bring its burden. Any weary spirits in the room tonight? Well, here you can bring your burden to Jesus, to the cross. The broken spirit can bring its sorrow. The guilty spirit brings its sin. The backsliding spirit brings its wandering. All are welcome here. The death of Jesus was the opening and it was the emptying of the full heart of God. It was the outgushing of that ocean of mercy that heaved and panted and longed for an outlet. In short, here's what it was. It was God showing how he can love a poor, guilty sinner like me. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that my God specializes and delights in reviving a weary, broken-spirited man again and again and again. Some of you, you've never experienced it. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night you saw people be baptized. You saw people say, here's what Jesus did for me from death to life. Tonight is the night to walk through that door to receive all that he's done for you in the cross. And others of you, you've experienced it, you've received it, you've forgotten it. Tonight is the night to remember what your Savior has done for you. Do you have sin to confess? Confess your sin. Do you have an awakening to experience? Cry out to him. Have you experienced the good that he has done and that he's given? Well, rejoice in him for that and thank him for Jesus Christ and all that comes with his blessing. Amen. So, Father, thank you for who you are. God, we rejoice in these nights of Revive Us, what you've done for us. Hey, these are just nights. God, you do it all throughout the year. We don't need nights like this to come together to experience your goodness. But, God, we thank you that you let us do it. So now, even now, as we prepare to go from this place, we rejoice in our God who specializes and delights in reviving his broken, weary, sinful people. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.